again, it's not a re I'm responsible for my own actions, you know, but it uh, made it very diff difficult or it just wasn't a life that I saw any real value in. Mm -hmm. Fast forward a little bit, uh, got into this uh, very unique crowd and uh, I was facing uh, 50 years in prison. Yeah, sitting in the county jail there and a youth pastor came and uh, just started talking to me. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Pay It Forward podcast. I am one of your hosts, Keegan. And I am the other host, Austin Seward. Awesome. So today we have a special guest, uh, the crime-fighting, cybersecurity, butt-kicking Rod Hollum on today. So we're super excited to have him on. So why don't you just share a little bit about yourself and introduce yourself to our audience. Excellent. Well, I'm Rod Holum, uh, founder and CEO of Cooley Tech Link. Uh, so we do IT support, cybersecurity, and uh, software development for small and medium manufacturers, uh, those that have uh, HIPAA and uh, ITAR and security compliance uh, needs. It's a really geeky way. So sounds really, really, really exciting when you say it that <laughs> way. <laughs> that, was a good, that was a good sales pitch. I yeah, think. yeah. I, I heard cyber. So well, honestly, if any of those words, you know, make your brain uh, just run or run away, I'm probably the guy you want to go and handle that. For exactly. Sure. So how, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and that. How long have you been a business owner? What did you do before that? So, uh, first time I, uh, started my own business, I think I was like 17 or 18 years old. We did a computer thing. So I've always been somewhat of a little, uh, little geek, you know, back building my computers and stuff like that. But, uh, we started, uh, Cooley Tech back in 2008. So I was working at, uh, Logistics Health Incorporated as uh, one of their first employees there. And uh, um, I was in charge of a contracting department that we were trying to set up a big, uh, big x-ray scanner, basically. And uh, long story short is I ended up trying to find a solution for it. None of our providers could do it. And I uh, built a little crane that allows me to set it up and uh, told them I quit and here's my contract. And they accepted it. So uh, uh, it was a pretty exciting opportunity. But with that, we were doing uh, um, really one weekend a month. Uh, we were pretty busy. And the rest were sitting there twiddling our thumbs. So we sat there and decided, you know what, let's try doing some IT stuff. And about two weeks, uh, yeah, it was two, two to four weeks after I started, my brother just happened to lose his job as well because of the business up in uh, where he was living. Uh, um, the people went out of business in long story short. So he called me up and said, all right, Rod, I'm hired. I'm coming down. And I'm like, all right, well, this will be interesting, you know, because uh, business was uh, about a month old at the time. And why not have my entire family group supported by this thing that uh, I don't know if me and my uh, wife and daughter can survive on. But, yeah. you know, so we uh, started doing that. And over the years, we early on in the business, we pretty much uh, do anything uh, for money that was legal, you know. <laughs> but yeah. uh, um, so everything from, I, mean, I remember uh, we'd network uh, buildings using, we didn't have any networking equipment, so we'd use like uh, tent poles to go in and fish over the drop seal tile and stuff like that and uh, do try doing some software development and, won a number of deals that we way underbid on. And, but uh, um, through, through that, we were very uh, fortunate that uh, after about probably 10 years or so, we really developed a niche and really more towards software development and IT support. And that, that was probably about, uh, oh yeah, 10 to, 10 to five years ago or so. And right about then, ransomware started to really become rampant. Uh, like I think it was around 2012, 2013, uh, somewhere in there. We got our first exposure with one of our clients that had ransomware. So I wrote an article on it, like, here's what you do and stuff like that. And for about a year or two, it was one of the first or top uh, search results on uh, on the internet for here's what ransomware is and stuff like that. Because at the time, from a security perspective, most businesses were really only worried about pop-ups and stuff like that. That was the extent of uh, what a hacker would do to you. And ransomware was one of the first times where now there's an actual method for them to steal actual money from you. So we just kind of continued to... Uh, grow that side of our business and uh, kind of refine how we protect business. And and nowadays, it I mean, uh, I probably I go to about five or six uh, cybersecurity conferences across the country a, a year just to find out what on earth the uh, hackers are doing and what are ways that we can protect them and try to take the uh, enterprise level protections and find ways that small, medium businesses can afford to be protected at that level. So what is uh, small to medium businesses, like what size revenue-wise is a company like that? <clears throat> Ours is more PC-based than revenue-wise, but uh, um, our primary client are those between 10 and 100 uh, endpoints, uh, which is just a, a computer device as a, as a whole. So that uh, um, you get much above 100, and uh, normally they'll have an internal IT person. Which we have a number of clients that we work with that are uh, what's called co-managed, where we will take one or more pieces of the 
uh, protection environment than they handle. So some might handle the internal, they want to handle PC setup and stuff like that, but want us to handle the security and server and stuff like that, where others are like, they want to handle the high level security and, and stuff. They just want someone to give a call for the PCs and stuff like that. But, but yeah, so really a uh, small, small business for us are 10 to a hundred PCs. Normally a business owned by, uh, um, someone who lives locally, not corporate, uh, based and, uh, someone who I can sit down and have coffee with and just want to be able to talk with, talk with if they're, if there's an issue. And a, a lot of it comes down to like, uh, cause the world that I live in is oftentimes Greek to most people, you know, they would have no idea what the difference, you know, between, you know, is your hard drive encrypted at rest or not? Is it uh you know, multi-factor? Do you have, it's all just geeky stuff that you're seeing on your cyber liability insurance or stuff like that, that, I mean, they just, they just have no idea. And it, you go try getting quotes on how much does it cost to fix that type of stuff. You'll find everything from something online that says for $2 a month, you'll be protected to, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year, a month mm-hmm. or a year or something like that. And all of them are accurate, just depending on the level of protection you're looking at getting. Wow. Yeah. So you see, so you say PC. <coughs> so can you settle the PC versus Mac debate? Macs aren't real computers, so. Okay. Got it. So <laughs> we can end that one there. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was pretty good. No. <laughs> that, was, that was pretty quick. So. That, that's my perspective. I'll have you know that my brother works and operates on a PC or on a Mac all day long, and I, I like to poke him all day long on it. So I'm a PC guy. Uh, normally, though, uh, so like if you're Mac does an excellent job for end user usability mm-hmm. and it's really nice and easy for that. They don't really have a good uh, um, if everyone needs to be networked together from a work perspective or centralized protection or anything like that. So if you have a if a business has five to ten uh, or more computers that all need to like share resources on a server or all need centralized uh, um, user management, Mac just doesn't do that great. That and it's not their market. You know their their market really is individuals that want a computer that just works and they don't want to have to do a bunch of stuff to make it work and they they, they thrive in that. So. So from a market penetration perspective, they have a large market share, but not really in the business community for that, for the lack of, I mean, Microsoft just is the 800 pound gorilla in the business environment. Yeah. We were talking about that. We we're like, anybody who knows computers is a PC guy. Everybody that has no idea is Mac, Apple, yep. but people who know computers, it seems like are PC people. hundred percent. Yeah. For me, it's just, I, mean, I, got, yeah. I got iPhone, my Mac super user friendly. <laughs> yeah. You want to open it up, look at the pretty cat pictures, and you know that's, what <laughs> and that's it. it. Right? Yeah, yeah. You know, as long as it does that, you're like, all right, I'm good. And yeah. Part of the, you know, Apple's just, yeah, it's just kind of got that. Oh, I got a Mac thing. You know, yeah. a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. So, but, Rod, why don't you share a little bit with us? Like, there's a a stereotype around IT people and like are more analytical, like technician based in the book. Uh, the E Myth talks about being the the technician in the business versus being the leader in your business. Um, and working in versus on. So like you said, you were kind of geeky as a kid Mm -hmm. and like the technical side of things. How did you, uh, not transition maybe, but how did you develop the leadership skills that are needed to run a business instead of just operating the technical side of the business? Some of that comes that, uh, um, so I was really blessed with my brother, Tim, to be able to come work with us because he is the classic super geek. Like, uh, um, like we've flown out to San Francisco to work on, you know, top secret projects with different uh, Fortune 550 companies. And like they're just blown away at his technical capabilities uh, where I just never really had that level of, of geek inside me. Uh, I was always technically capable, you know, analytical and stuff like that. You know, I could install a computer and all that type of stuff. So as we uh, the first couple of jobs that I had uh, before I started my own business and we I'd always try to do some side gig, right? You know, I have a laundry list of failures from businesses that we can talk about later if you want to. You know, there are, some are funny, some aren't, but uh, uh, all legal, right? All legal. <laughs> Mo- yeah. <laughs> uh, but so I always had like a, a, a natural inclination to just want to be my own boss and that's primary because I don't really play well with others. Yeah. So like I, and by almost every one of my jobs, I was either fired, demoted, or I'd accelerate quickly to leadership. Like when I worked at LHI, in a matter of six months, I went from, you know, a credentialer, which is basically uh, someone just a uh, administrative assistant, up to I led a department that managed ten million dollars a year in uh, expenses, you know, and had uh, ten people as well. But I was demoted from that as well after a couple of years because every year I'd do something that'd get me written up, and in hindsight, I'm like, yeah, Rod, you were dumb, <laughs> right? What on earth are you doing, you know? But Anyway, so that or uh, like uh, when I was on staff at uh, a church, I uh, we had this uh, again grew the youth department real quick and you know grew leaders and stuff like that. But I went and did a uh, airsoft thing and uh, um, which uh, 
and I put posters of these little cartoon kids shooting each other and said, come shoot your friends at Red Cedar Community Church. <laughs> or, and I posted them all around the high school. So yeah. that way every kid walking in in front grew our youth department from six to 60 kids, but also ended up getting one kid expelled because he uh, was playing airsoft, left his gun in his car and just went to the school and didn't think about it. And yeah, so we got a nice little meeting with uh, pretty much every legal official in, the, in Barron County out there at the time. And they're like, bro, you can't <laughs> yeah. be doing this. <laughs> You know, so so I'm like, so kids, I, kids loved it though. Kids loved it, you know, and yeah. I, I was like, and, and, and what I loved about it, I mean, we were reaching a bunch of unchurched kids going there, right? Because I mean, yeah. we were the only church that was playing around with guns in the church, right? <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> but I mean, I just I I loved you know connecting with those kids and stuff like that. But uh, but anyway, so having people over me just never really seemed to work well with me. And in fact, my boss there said that, uh, Rod, you're confident to the point of idiocy, you know, and he was accurate <laughs> in that aspect, you know, for sure. But uh, um, so when I worked at LHI again, I had, came up with this contract. And at the time, I had just been demoted. So, you know, I mean, and again, my manager loved me. Like, Rod, you got great ideas, stuff like that. But you're a pain in my, you know, she didn't say yeah. that. But I mean, you could tell she's like, oh, I just can't take another conversation with you, Rod. I just... <laughs> You know, I'd come in there and tell her an idea, and she's like, Rod, you just have to stop, please. <laughs> and, but anyway, like one of the things I did is uh, we wanted to bring all this stuff internally, and I realized that we could save about $2 million a year by doing so. So I'm like, yeah, this makes sense. I didn't get anyone's permission to do it. I just did it. So I went ahead and <laughs> blasted this thing to 50,000 medical professionals. I swamped the HR department of uh, uh, LHI for over a month with nonstop. Like I pressed send on it, and my phone did not stop ringing for over a week. And those that couldn't get through to me would go to the uh, um, HR department and stuff like that. So anyway, she was exhausted at my ideas. So yeah. long story short, I started this contract. And uh, yeah, we just went ahead and uh, I proposed, like, here's my two-week notice. And she's like, could you do three-week th- three notice? There's a couple projects. We just want you to finish before you leave. I'm like, yeah, no problem. And then uh, here's my contract if you want me to handle this. I was like, yeah, we like the idea. I just can't work here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, She didn't say that, you know, but I mean, uh, that, that was the... Uh, <laughs> so it was implied. It was implied, you know. So I mean, uh, my my time there had come to an end. So yeah, we started it and I uh, was able to grow pretty quickly. We did about two hundred thousand revenue our first year, three hundred fifty the next year, and half a million the uh, third year. And for myself, that was I mean, I had more money there than like every year I was making more money than my parents combined their entire life. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was it, it was un- unbelievable, you know. And uh, and but with that came a lot of challenge. Like, how do you manage money? Like when I started it, I just man, I just go ahead and invoice when my money was getting low right well it obviously or it doesn't take uh, long to realize that as a, a fast growing business you run out of money real quick you know sure. and like th- there's times when we we're driving all across the country and i literally had like 200 dollars to my name and i have three four employees out there which are you sucking through like about 500 dollars, and i'm like boy i have no idea how and luckily you know you know checks would just come or you know right at the right time and but i remember the lot of the there's a lot of things the first couple of years in business that that we probably we definitely should have been out of business for sure, but uh, you know I was just very blessed that that didn't happen, and uh, through those I was able to to learn much better money management skills, proper or, uh, employee management skills, which is still a constant uh, uh, thing that I have to teach myself how to properly manage individuals. Because every time you get a new team member, yeah. you have a new uh, mix into how that uh, how that plays with the team, how to connect with that individual, and how many employees do you have right now? So I have ten right now. Okay. I think. Yeah, we'll say 10. Okay. <laughs> Cuz you're doing are you did you get into a new building or construction? Yep, I yeah, we purchased that. a new building up in uh, um up in Holman there, so they're doing a full build out of that. So I think uh actually they got done with it yesterday, so we're doing the network install in there. Uh one of my techs is up there today doing that. So then the next couple of weeks we'll be actually moving into that building as well. So cool. we're pretty excited That's about perfect. that and That's awesome. Mhm. So how have you how have you um, like changed from when you first started your business to now in terms of either like your leadership or just business expertise because, I mean, our whole podcast <clears throat> is kind of geared towards entre- entrepreneurs, business mm-hmm. people. So for somebody that's new or just starting out or has maybe kind of been through some of those same hiccups as you is year one, year two, I never have enough, enough cash. What was something you learned or a big like vital key to getting better at that or scaling or organizing your business in a way to where it's not, oh my gosh, I'm out on this business trip. I got 200 bucks left to my name. Was there something that you learned or figured out along the way? So if I could talk to Rodney from 15 years ago, you know, yeah. give, give him some advice. What, 
you know, one of the first things I'd say is uh, don't be afraid to charge more. Uh, and the primary reason is that uh, I think it's over at Lacrosse Glass. They have a uh, um, a thing on their wall that says, you know, customers uh, remember the pain of bad service long after the joy of a low cost. You know, and uh, you know, I saw that and it was like, wow, that really connected with me. You know, and it's true. Like uh, when you charge more, you have the ability to hire better staff. You have the ability to uh, provide a better service, do more due diligence, stuff like that. Whereas if uh, like early on. I was just, again, like I said, if there was a check, I would just go ahead and do it, right? Because, again, I, I had earned, you know, maybe $12, $15 an hour was the max I'd ever earned in my life, right? So if I'm earning $30 to $50 an hour as a subcontractor, I'm like, man, I, I, what do you even do with all this money, right? Yeah. It didn't take me learn, long to realize that, wait a minute, there's a lot of, you got to pay accountants, you got building expenses, you have insurance. What on earth were all these? I didn't have these when I didn't have a business, you For know? Sure. You know, so, uh, so, yeah, I think that would probably the biggest thing is just a, Go ahead and, yeah, j- just charge more. And while it sounds greedy at first, I mean, you really do have the ability to uh, serve the customers that can afford it in a much better way and just have a much better relationship with those than those that uh, can't necessarily afford it. Because at least in my in my industry, like uh, like cybersecurity or IT support or stuff like that, you know, I, I need to work with businesses that that is critical to what they do, right? Where if their server goes down or if they're ransomware or something like that, they're just out of business. So that way I can afford, that way I can uh, charge what I need to to be able to have the staff that have the expertise to be able to protect that, be able to, like the conference I go to are not cheap to go to, you know, and stuff like that. I need to be able to earn the revenue to be able to make sure that I can stay on top of my game in those areas. So, so yeah, I would say biggest thing I would say to any young entrepreneur would be just charge more and don't be afraid of losing a contract or do. In fact, it, if you're winning every deal you go do, you're probably not charging enough. For sure. Is uh, yeah. what, I, what I would say. And it sounds kind of, and uh, I can understand the uh, apprehension too of uh, again, you're just starting a business, you, you're afraid of losing that deal because if you don't, you don't win that deal, you might have to go face your wife and say, I don't, I can't afford our house payment this month, you know. And mm-hmm. I mean, that, there's real fear associated to that that can't be underestimated. Uh, but if you want to go ahead and have a longevity of a business, you you need to be able to charge what that is. So, and the other thing is, uh, really, it's the the, the focus on being a salesperson far more than a technician or your abilities, right? You know, and uh, I think it was the uh, Robert Kawasaki book mentioned that, uh, you know, one of the stories that I really loved about that, it just really stuck with me. And I read that back when I was working at LHI 20 years ago. Which but, book? Uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yep. Was uh, one of the things that is that uh, he was talking, or at least in the book anyway, he was uh, he wrote that he talked to, a, I think it was a book writer, right? Mm-hmm. And she wanted to be this amazing book writer to know the best writing author and stuff like that. Yep. And just ask her a question of, uh, does the New York Times have a best written author category? You know, it's like, no, they have a best selling author. It doesn't matter what your book uh, has inside of it. How well can you sell that thing? Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, and again, she took a huge offense to it in the book, right? Now, I've since learned that it sounds like a lot of the stuff that he wrote about there were not necessarily true, but had uh, um, good business principles behind it. But I mean, that one really stuck with me. Like, uh, you don't have to be the actual best, but what you want to do is be knowledgeable enough so that you can connect to a client in a way that will help them with what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Like, and how I relate that to like a cybersecurity perspective is, I know like where the gold level standard is. I also know most businesses honestly just can't afford it. Mm-hmm. You know, when it comes down to it, they just can't, right? So my job comes down to like, in essence, what corners can we cut to get you as protected as possible? And then make sure that you understand what risks you're taking by not doing those type of protections. And uh, all that requires the ability to look at it from a salesperson's perspective, like, I know this is what it costs to do this. How can I connect with a client to let them know that you really should be spending a little bit more than you are now, but also just acknowledge that they can't spend the gold standard. Right. So, is there a like a percent of revenue that somebody should budget for their IT? That's a business owner, entrepreneur that you see like a range. So normally, uh, what we normally go off is uh, about two thousand dollars per computer per year is okay. uh, is the average. Uh, okay. Which. And that, that, it just depends on the industry, uh, like healthcare, uh, probably a little bit more than that. Um, but yeah, if you look at just the, the overall support costs, and these are pretty industry wide, mm-hmm. that's, that's about, if you have an internal IT person, if you go and calculate their salary and you know, everything like that, that's where you're going to land as far as a number where if you're outsourcing or anything like that. Hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about, uh, like what are some things that business owners that like, for me, this is all Chinese, right? So um, what are some things, what are maybe the top three common hacks that you see happening to small business owners right now and what can they do to avoid those? 
The biggest one, uh, and I believe Microsoft has a stat that it's uh, 99% of all hacks. So it's not even just like, you know, in the top three, it is the number one, is an email phishing campaign uh, where they'll send you a link and it's, we all get those like, hey, are you actually logging into Amazon? Are you actually logging into Facebook? Are you actually logging into any of these type of things, right? And the actual hack there is that how it works is that they, they send that, you know, you get the approved deny. You click deny. They just want you to authorize that you're actually who you are, and then it gets denied. However, hackers will actually send that so that when you click deny and you type in your username and password, they actually get your username and password in there mm-hmm. So by doing so. Uh, and then they go, all right, we're good. Uh, we de- denied that thing, but you just gave them their username and password. Uh, and so that is uh, the majority, almost, uh, yeah, I would say easily uh, nine out of 10 type of hacks are some type of email phishing like that. And the biggest reason that's a huge risk for uh, individuals is that number one, uh, most of your accounts receivable and accounts payable all come and go out of your email. So what they will do is they'll look in your sent mail for any invoices that have been sent out, resend it to the person from your email and say, if you pay by end of day to this uh, um, bank account, now all of a sudden uh, we'll, we'll take 10% off or 20% off, right? Mm-hmm. And it's coming from the person who actually sent it. It looks legitimate. And if they go ahead and pay that, who's legally liable than that? Even though they didn't pay you, you know, they paid the authorized person that sent them the email the way that that person told them to do. Mm-hmm. So uh, we've seen some huge numbers be hit up uh, that way. So that's a um, definitely the the number one breach, I would say, happens. And uh, outside of that, I mean, it's uh, some variant of uh, they get an email through where they uh, land a, a Trojan or backdoor or something into the computer that they're then they'll use to ransomware the uh, system as a whole. Hmm. That's crazy. What are some some crazy ones? So besides the 99%, what's like the most unique, crazy or just like that is wild. They're just getting so smart. Obviously, it's a huge thing that's happening right now, cybersecurity. Is there any that stick out in your mind that are just absolutely yeah. creative? So a couple. One, one is uh, um, speaking down in Nashville at a cybersecurity conference, and one of the uh, attendees was uh, also an IT provider, and they came up and said that the day before that, there was a, uh, um, a CEO of one of his firms uh, had sent an email to his accountant that said, hey, here's the wire instructions for that new building we're buying. It was a $2.1 million. They were uh, emailing the wire instructions for where to send the money for the $2.1 million purchase. Well, hackers were sitting in his email watching all his sent ones. They saw that. It flagged it immediately. He immediately, within 30 seconds, sent a new one. Like, I'm sorry, that's the old one. Make sure to send it to this one here. Uh, mm. and, and created their own uh, routing number and then created a rule inside the email. So that way, any emails that comes back for confirmation gets hidden into a subfolder so the CEO would never see it. So they had went and actually wired $2.1 million to, this, uh, um, to these offshore, you know, whatever country they were from, people. And the worst part about that was that they had never, or this is the second time a $2 million attack like that had happened to this firm. So they obviously had some money to play with, right? I mean, you, can't, you don't lose $2 million yeah. multiple times without it being like, you know. Devastating. <laughs> yeah, devastating. Yeah. You know, but for them, they, they had the money to do it. But an uh, easy way to solve that is just enable multi-factor authentication. Again, that IT provider there had talked to that client numerous times, but he just came up and told me because I was talking on the topic. And he's like, boy, I got a story for you. And it literally happened yesterday, so... That was a, wild. That was a pretty pretty big one. Uh, some other ones, like uh, we oftentimes go around to business and do like uh, network assessments and stuff like that. And uh, one of the times I was sitting there talking with the CEO and the uh, CFO came right in like, all right, I got those uh, six uh, um, gift cards that you wanted. You know, yep. what, what do you want these other five? And, and the CEO's like, I didn't tell you to do anything. I'm like, all right, you guys really need my help here. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, the, I've seen that probably five or six times where people yep. have actually bought the gift cards. And the... And the hackers play on your emotions that way. So normally how that type of attack will happen is they, they'll, they'll say, like, uh, Keegan, you've been doing such a great job, uh, you know, lately here. I want you to get five. It, uh, agreed. Uh, yeah, agreed. <laughs> I mean, it's just assumed, right? <laughs> yeah. But I want you to get five gift cards for $500. I want you to keep one. I mean, you're doing awesome. I got four for the other techs here. So like, you can just go down and do Walmart, GameStop, whatever. Get five of those cards. Uh, send me the picture of the other four and keep that one for yourself because you're so awesome, right? And what that does is that plays on the person's emotion that yeah, I am awesome, right? I am doing a good job. And you know what? My boss is recognizing me. I appreciate that, right? Yep. So they just want they want it to be true. Mm-hmm. Yep. So they go and do it. They also and send the picture off. And as soon as they do, the with the pictures, they can go ahead and uh, redeem those codes online. Uh, you don't need the actual card anymore. So therefore, they go and redeem them. And, but yeah, that, that had happened numerous times uh, to different businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I can think of three times right offhand that 
like they're literally hanging on to the cards either when they're calling me or they or they're calling me like hey the so and so got some cards and stuff like that so mm-hmm. probably that, that, that happened in real estate before oh, I yeah. joined the Seawork group. For sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was with OneTrust, and Josh, not Josh, <laughs> texted me. I did not plan the emotions. I was not doing a great job. Uh, just kidding. I, <laughs> they did not plan that side of it, but it was it was very, hey, can't can't get there in time. Could you bring this or whatever mm-hmm. for a meeting? So, yeah, it wasn't so much playing on the emotions of, oh, you're doing such a great job. But, again, hey, I wasn't able to scoop these up. Could you do them? And I'm immediately like, Luckily, I know him, and I'm like, he's not going to ask me to buy gift cards. This is so yeah. weird. Yeah. Uh, and then I think it happened probably four or five more times. By like the fourth time, I'm like, all right, let's have fun with this. So, you know, I was on my way. I was texting him back. Oh, I'm on my way. Does it, do you have <laughs> yeah. a specific gift card that you want? They're like, no, just buy this. Oh, shoot. Target's all out. I got to go over to Walmart, whatever. I think it was three and a half, like four <laughs> hours. Finally, the guy, I think, texted me back something like, whatever, something super fun and pleasant, like, Mm-hmm. I know that you're not trying to do this anymore, and I was like, "Have a great day." Yeah, so that was kind of fun. No, I, or, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I enjoy texting back with the hackers, you know, <laughs> <laughs> playing with them. It's it's fun, good fun, but yeah. yeah. Do you ever mess with them when you cut? Like, oh, I don't know how. Oh, again, yeah. I don't know how it really works. So, like, if you are like catching them or whatever, do you, you know, give them the old rod jab and kind of get them? <laughs> no, yeah. For number one, it's illegal to hack them back. So uh, even if though they're hacking you, I uh, um because uh. I believe it's a Millennium Act from the, in the 90s or something like that. But basically, uh, the, the, the law in general cites that you cannot access a system you do not have authorized to access. So even though they're hacking you, you don't have authorization to uh, access their system. So you could actually be uh, um, fined, sued, or uh, imprisoned for hacking by reverse hacking. But you could if you wanted to. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so my sister-in-law's uh, um, Facebook account once got uh, hacked. And my brother Tim, in a matter of like, I don't know, five minutes, was able to get reverse hack it and get it back. And then, so he and he and them just ended up sitting and talking for a while on like, yeah, you got me, you know, stuff like that, because they still had access to it, but uh, they couldn't do anything because the password. So like, um, so they're just talking back and forth, like uh, they almost like uh, you know, tipping the hat, like, all right, well played. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. You, you got, got me. Got me. Back. Yeah. So we've. Uh... We've been seeing it more in real estate of hackers targeting real estate agents and not just, I mean, it's always been the wire fraud issue of real estate transactions and stuff like that. But, um, I mean, some online leads that we have got um, are targeting real estate agents to basically build a relationships with them. And I know someone who um, lost about $20,000 from a hacker that built a relationship with him for a period of three, four months, um, said, this is what you need to do. And, um, around crypto and like he, this guy's a really good crypto investor and, um, wanted his money and got him to invest money on this certain exchange that he was the owner of the exchange. And when he tried to withdraw the funds, the funds were frozen and they're gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and that person came in on online real estate lead. Um, legitimately saying that he wanted to buy a house and then just, I mean, the dude was, he had some time invested into it, but made 20 grand off of it. So, yeah, kind of crazy. No, you're going to see a lot more of that, like uh, to switch gears with the, uh, on AI. Yeah, one tell of the, more one about of the big, that. Yeah, one of the biggest advantages that uh, AI gives hackers is that you can go into the AI. So let's say the normal tell for almost any of uh, those type of email phishing ones is that their English isn't great. You know, like they might say like, we speak English. We delivery or something like that, right? Yeah, it's just we, like we delivery. Yeah, <laughs> it's like eh, that's not it. That's not English, right? Yeah. However, if you copy and paste that into ChatGPT and say, "Hey, can you make this short uh, with good grammar and an Eng- Midwestern English uh, accent, or you know, like it's from New York, or you know, you can really geo-target it," it'll spit out it like in, mm. in how someone would say that, right? You know, now we we've done a couple of live hack demonstrations where we're showing people. I can go on LinkedIn, I find a little bit about you, then all of a sudden craft an email that goes ahead and gets sent to, yeah, I guess another common hack, I, again, it's all under the phishing, but uh, especially payroll uh, scams is that uh, an accountant or HR department gets emailed like, hey, can you update my uh, direct deposit information? Like, I don't know if you guys get uh, your guys' commissions, direct deposit, yeah. or however that works, right? But uh, they'll email it and say, and they'll just create a Gmail account or something like that, so, uh, so it's first and last name. But they can go in there, like see that you're maybe a part of First Free, or maybe you go ahead and uh, um, are on the Realtor board, or you know whatever it is, right? Yep. And say like, hey, I've been busy. I've been meaning to talk to you. you can go ahead and uh, update my payroll information. 
to direct deposit to this account instead of this one. And we've seen a couple of clients get hit with that type of a scam. And uh, ChatGPT is just going to exponentially make that because while they might have taken three, four months to interact back and forth, mm -hmm. ChatGPT can interact for them. It doesn't even need to be a real human on the other side of that anymore. Mm -hmm. It can go ahead and, and ChatGPT, but there's no, you got Bard out there, you have a, and there's a number of open source ones coming out there. And the open source, like uh, a lot of the mainstream ones, GPT or Bard or, or any of those, they have decent rails on them, but you can still get around them, right? Again, you can't say, write an excellent phishing scam for me, right? It'll say, no, I don't do that. But you yeah. can say is, hey, I'm so-and-so from here. I want to email my HR department from this company. Could you craft up a reasonable sounding email? And it's like, yeah, I'll help you out, buddy. I got you. <laughs> you know, and it, it, it does it, right? So, I mean, that's wild. yeah, you almost learn how to talk to it, right? But uh, um, eventually, or not even, I mean, they're out there right now is that uh, these open source ones, might not be as powerful as GPT, but even if they're 90% as close and narrowly focused to just phishing attacks or anything like that, you can spit out 100,000 of these type of accounts instantly mm. and uh, really machine gun this type of stuff. So I, my prediction would be by the end of this year, you're just going to see it be inundated with uh, those type of scams. And it's mm. all going to be from automated bots. They're not even going to be real people, even though like the, the Turing test is one that when you're talking to a computer, can you really tell you're talking to one? And these AIs can pass that now really, really well. Hmm. Now they need, that so that's why everybody's got to call Rod. That's why everyone needs to call Rod. <laughs> but it, it, even that though, like from a cybersecurity perspective, it's not so much a systems protection, it's more of an education perspective, For right? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I can put all the protection in place that you want, but it's somehow you have access to the systems, right? Because that's part of my job is that the most protected computer is the one that's turned off in a safe in the basement locked up that no one can touch, right? right. I can probably say pretty confidently that, that one without you know an armed assault from the SWAT team is not going to get breached. Mm -hmm. you know, however, if you're going to have access to it, well, then the hackers are always going to be uh, targeting the weakest link. And unfortunately, humans are the weakest link on that. Mm -hmm. Talking a little bit about AI, you got both of your books here, Rod. Why don't you plug your books a little bit? Tell us about what they are and how you wrote them. Oh, yeah. I was on vacation, and uh, the first one we wrote, uh, the uh, Colonial Pipeline uh, hack, was uh, that, that was back when that was hot on the news. I'm like, so I guess I'll, I'll rewind a little bit. So the first book I ever wrote was uh, to my wife uh, for Valentine's Day. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, you can, It's on Amazon. You can go in there. It's like, uh, um, why Laura Holm is awesome for the man that knows her best or something like that, right? <laughs> I, I scored all the brownie points and made yeah. every husband look like a chump that day. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, top shelf in it, right? Yeah. So I'm like, all right, I know how to write a book. I, and then I let it to the side, right? So I was down on vacation in Florida, um, and it was like 9,000 degrees outside, and you could <laughs> swim uh, through the air. You know, I was like, yeah. I want to be inside in the AC. I don't want to do squat, right? <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, you know, I could probably go ahead and uh, write a book. So uh, at the time, uh, Jasper AI had came out, and my uh, um, written capabilities are that about of a third grader. So if you ever get an email from me, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're all interchangeable as far as I'm concerned, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so it, it looks like a third grader, right? So it's why I've never really written anything before because number one, my reading comprehension is horrible and my written uh, ability is even less, you know? it's a, But so I'm like, you know what? I, I was trying it and uh, at the time, Jasper, and this was back 2018, 2019, stuff like that. Jasper, was a, which was another AI, was about a high school uh, writer level, right? You know, yeah. it wasn't doing college level work or anything like that. But when you have a third grade uh, writing level, right, for high sure. school looks like, you know, Stick that's Stephen up. King stuff, you know? Yeah. So I'm like, all right, let's go ahead and try this. So yeah, I was trying it, and it's writing about 200 words at a time. So it, it, it basically treated it as like I had a high school student there, and I would tell them what I'm looking for. They'd write out what they think, and I'm like, ah, that's not right. Or And it basically a, a guided tour on be, the ability to actually write the book as a whole. So that way, and and I think a matter of about 20 hours, I was able to write, you know, the the whole book here, so, and made it nice big print so people can read it easily and stuff like that, but, uh, so that worked out pretty well. It had a pretty short uh, shelf life, though, because while everyone's not super into the uh, hacks and stuff like that, like I am, so after about six months, people are like, what was the Colonial Pipeline? I'm like, it stopped 45% of the fuel to the East Coast for weeks. How do you not, anyway, so I'm like, all right, well, that was a good book, and it was fun experience, stuff like that, but I obviously need a new one, right? Because yep. this one no longer has the shelf life that uh, that one, the other one's pretty much worthless. I can say yep. I wrote a book, but now, anyway. So then I wrote the second one. I'm like, because again, I was at Thanksgiving with the, the family down there for a week, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write another book. Why not? So I got nothing else to do. I'm uh, away from work, and uh, it's a good opportunity for me to do it. So I pounded out one that 
is a little more ethical to business, which basically just has a, I basically took a little time to brainstorm what are, what are the seven main things I'm seeing from a cybersecurity perspective that maybe a lot of businesses are not either being educated on or their internal IT might not be as knowledgeable on. So uh, these are the seven areas that they can go. So we got the uh, the seven business cybersecurity mistakes your IT guy is making. There it is. There it is. So both of those are originated when you're on vacation in Florida. Yeah. And done within a matter of hours. About 20 to 30 hours total okay. is uh, what investment into each one. So. Okay. That's what people say is that Florida is the best place to write a book. So that's, yeah. what, that's what I hear. <laughs> one was made in South Carolina, I guess, so technically. Okay. So, yeah, I'd like to do uh, two more this summer, but we'll just see if I can get the time to get away and do it. So I want to do one on uh, um, the cyber liability insurances on how to pass that properly. Because uh, uh, the biggest thing I see when I'm working with businesses on that is that they're unintentionally lying on their cyber liability insurance. Because uh, they're like, oh, yeah, we have the revision to back up, and we have you know all the stuff, and they just don't, right? right. And if you ever get uh, breached, I, I forget what the exact stat is, but uh, a huge number of these uh, cyber liability insurances are not paying out because uh, when they go and do the assessment, they find out that how they filled that thing out was not actually done correctly. So it invalidates the policy. So you pay money on a policy, and you have a false sense of protection that doesn't really exist. So it's kind of like having sprinklers that no one hooked the water up to. Yeah. Mm. So uh, um, just a book on what do all those super geeky things mean and how, how can you uh, realistically apply those. So that's going to be my next book for sure. Uh, um, I think I've been talking for six months. I'm going to go write that. I just haven't had the opportunity to right. really dedicate a week to, to do so. Well, cool. Chat GPT, are you going yeah, to go back to Jasper? Has Jasper no, Ch- improved Chad- or still in high school? So Chat GPT is uh, probably more of a college level uh, AI at this point. So uh, 3.5, so 4.0 would be nice, except for it's too slow, whereas 3.5 is nearly instant now. So I, I would probably do uh, use uh, 3.5 to assist. So I, I, and uh, 3.5 has passed uh, the bar exam. It's passed uh, numerous uh, um, master's uh, finish, uh, final exams. And so, I mean, it, uh, it is as knowledgeable as a college grad in most uh, areas. So well, that's, that's kind of scary, in my opinion. Or not for I, there's positives, but it's kind of hmm. a little scary. Any tool can be used uh, for good or bad. Yeah. Right. So uh, really, just a matter. A, a tool is just a tool. It depends on whose hand it's in. Yep. I for sure would have had better high school grades. Oh yeah. No, it'll for definitely sure. it'll definitely transform uh, education, and uh, they're going to have a hard time uh, accepting that uh, maybe writing isn't as unique of a skill anymore as it used to be. Because I mean, yeah. if your friend Rodney can produce books, <laughs> I mean, I think that is, <laughs> it is not <laughs> New York Times bestseller. I uh, didn't get on the New York Times one, so... But, next uh, book. Next book. We'll shoot for that. Mm. Right. So, Rod, uh, kind of our vision behind the podcast is to kind of redefine the definition of what success looks like in somebody's life. And you shared having a business with $200 to your name and making more money than your parents in their lifetime. And I imagine you're still in business and doing well. So what has... What, what does success look like to you? Maybe it's money, maybe it's not, maybe it's quality of life. Like, what, is, what does that look like to you? Yeah. So and I was thinking about that question a lot. Like, for myself, I was thinking, like, uh, I remember when I was a teenager and uh, sitting down with my mother and uh, she was like, all right, it's important you know how to, you know, change the oil in your car and stuff like that, right? And at that time, I sat there and I remember very clear, like, mom, I'm going to be so rich, I can have someone else go ahead and uh, change my oil, right? <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was my definition of rich back then, right? Yeah. Because I, I had grown up dirt poor, you know? I mean, I had lived in a different house almost every year of my life. And, uh, like, when our tranny goes out in our, our car, you don't go get a new car. You go to the junkyard, find a tranny, take it out, put it into the new car, and put it in there. And now all of a sudden, your car can make it a little, you know? Mm. So, yep. so to me back then, success was that I was rich enough that someone, I could go into, like, a Jiffy Lube or you know, uh, Grease Lightning, which is where I go right now all the time, right? Yep. That was success to me, right? Yep. Jiffy Lube. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> Jiffy Lube is the epitome of success. Yes, you know? So that's why I was thinking, I'm like, man, that is a, that's a tough question because I think uh, at any stage in your life, it, it really looks differently, you know? When you're a single young dude, but, you know, still underneath your parents' house, you know, I mean, it normally has some type of monetary or uh, career achievement to it, I think, mm-hmm. you know? And then uh, as I, you know moved on in life, got married, and, you know, having a good marriage to me, that, that was a level of success. You know, my, uh, my mother was divorced three times, and my fathers both went to prison and stuff like that. So, I mean, like, you know, have, having a marriage where, you know, I can just love my wife, that, that was success for me at that time, you know? And uh, been married for 20 years now, 
and uh, still going strong. And uh, a greater, greater joy in me is that uh, not only have I been married for 20 years, my brothers have also both been married for, you know, without divorce their entire time, you know, and, uh, you know, to be able to bring that into my family tree and, uh, you know, they've taken a lot of work on their own part to, you know, remove uh, um, generational sins and stuff like that that we learned. But uh, um, just being, able, so that, that to me was a huge level of success. And then all of a sudden you enter in kids into the equation, right? Yeah. You know, you get those little teeny rugrats and stuff. And I think it adds a new level of success at that point of, uh, like, not only, I, I can't just be a good father anymore, you know, I, I have to be a good father. Uh, good husband anymore. Mm -hmm. I had to be a good father, right? You know, I mean, I grew up with multiple dads and abuse and stuff like that. And uh, so like success originally was like, all right, my kids are never going to know anger, you know, from, yeah. you know, uh, you know, violent hand or anything like that. that. That's success as a parent, you know? Well, that that's a pretty low uh, bar to <laughs> create, you know? Yeah. So you, you and again, uh, the good Lord was uh, kind enough to bring a number of great mentors into my life early on. And, uh, um, so they, they help walk me like, Hey, this is what it means to be a man. You know, here, here's how you, uh, you know, treat a young lady. Here's how you do a father, you know, do the father stuff. And, um, so I, as that goes, I, I mean, that, that really became my, I just want my kids to know I love them and care for them. And, uh, they don't grow up with that type of thing. You know, that was success. So now I got a 16 year old, 14 year old, 12 year old, and I have the, the business and stuff like that. And at this point, I mean, I, Success to me is just having a, a a good relationship with my kids, uh, but have a wife that knows I love her, and you know the the business. I I love being a business owner, I really do. But I mean, if the good Lord took that away from me tomorrow, I'm fine. You know, yeah. I, um, I can go to a trailer and I'll be good to go. You know, and yeah. so that that's I think the best I could answer that question. Uh, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I think that's great because I mean that's I mean, a lot of people see it as just monetary, right? And I think one thing that stuck out as you were talking is um, that definition has changed in different seasons of life, and it hasn't been this overarching "I'm successful or I'm not." It's it's changed in different seasons of life, and um, you're in a very different season than we are, and it probably looks differently for us than it does for you, and. Um, but I think that's what's important for our listeners to be able to hear different perspectives and wisdom from others who've um, just define that differently and maybe strive for something differently than social media and society tells them to strive for. So, mm -hmm. yeah, really good. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And I, I couldn't help but think, too, is so for you, if your business gets taken away again, I mean, what an awesome place to get to where it's not about materialistic things or it's about this or my business has to be doing this well, but it's this level of my identity is not necessarily what I do in my business. And so there's this comfort level of, yeah, if, if that were to be taken away, I'm good. But then it's also, also super awesome that you can still provide so much to everybody that's like a part of your team. And I think the success of Cooley Tech and how it's growing and getting bigger and bigger, I just think that's awesome. And oh, yeah. I'm a... I mean, most people that are around me are like a site that it's like trying to take a sip of water from a fire hose, right? Yeah. I mean, I am passionate about growth and improving our process and continue improvement and stuff like that, you know? I mean, one of my favorite books of the Bible is the, the story of Job. And I just love the idea that a super successful, awesome business leader, you know, really, I mean, he had thousands of camels and cows and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And a matter of a day or two took it away. Uh, and he was still, you know, loved God. And he, I mean, all the main things in his life we're still there, even without all that type of stuff. And I don't think uh, if we were to sit down with Job and be like, hey, Job, if you're sitting on this, you know, dirt hill, you know, scratching yourself from sores, or when you had all those cows and servants and stuff like that, which lifestyle did you like more, right? Right. I mean, it, so like where I'm at right now from a life perspective, I mean, I, I, I enjoy having property. I can bring my uh, son out to, like last weekend, we were out there all weekend, bring, dragging a four-wheeler up the hill and getting a glamping dome up and running and, you know, being able to go and have a, um like, like uh, hang out and watch, TV with my daughter on a big TV and stuff like that. I, I enjoy all that type of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. being able to, uh, my wife and I's favorite spot to go out to eat is this little, uh, um, ramen place in Sparta. We go there like, like we're talking like <laughs> every one of our date nights. That's the only place we go to. Right. Really? Uh, uh, yeah. All that stuff just takes money to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Now again, if I didn't have money, we'd go have little Caesars, uh, in our kitchen floor, like we used to back when we didn't right. have money, you know? And, yeah. uh, you know, the, uh, so it, money is definitely fun. Right. But it's, uh, on a long enough timeline, you're not going to have any, right? You know, and I think it it's good to have both the desire to 
want to continue to improve who you are because you the more money you have the more you can help people right right but at the end of the day if the good lord just choose like look that's just not the season i want you in right now you know i i personally think the uh, job is a great example of now again at the end of the story of job he gets a little uh mad at god and who wouldn't try? Right? You know, yeah. <laughs> I love God's response. They're like, bro, where were you when I made everything here? Just settle down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, no, I think that's a good that's a good perspective. Um, so, are we gonna bring it up? Oh, we're gonna bring it up. <laughs> Rod, are you ready for this? <laughs> I'm ready. In case people don't know, not only do you now kick butts of cyber criminals, but the rumor mill says back in the day. Somebody might have kicked your butt when you were a supposed criminal. Is this true? Yep. As I, as I mentioned uh, <laughs> earlier on, uh, the uh, I had a very colorful upbringing, right? You yeah. Know, uh, um, uh, yeah. M- mother abused, and I, the standard poor little me old story is what I call, it, right? You know, plum disease. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, so, yeah. First time I was in the county jail was when I was 11 years old. Uh, I uh, threatened to burn down my mom's house. She was going to ground me for something I definitely deserved to be grounded for, right? Yeah. You know. So, uh, so down she goes. <laughs> yep. I, uh, I cut the phone lines. I locked myself in her room and said I was going to burn down her house. Sorry. Oh my god! You know, it's not funny. <laughs> it's not funny. You know, I mean, uh, again, I look back and it was on my little brother's birthday, the one that's working with me. You know, mm. November 5th of uh, 2011. Happy what, birthday, bro! Oh, 90, 91, I guess. Yeah. Hmm. Happy so, birthday, bro. Uh, your no, he, house is gone. <laughs> so there were squad cars around. I got hogtied, taken away. I ended up living, really? with, living with my uh, biological father at the time. And I mean, and my mother at the time, she was a single mother with four kids. The youngest was pre preschool. And, you know, uh, my stepfather at the time, but uh, I don't know if he was in prison yet, but uh, he was, uh, if he wasn't yet, I mean, he was uh, separated from her. So anyway, uh, um, so that was the first time I had a uh, exposure to the uh, legal system. You know, uh, was not nowhere near my last. Uh, um, you know, grew up through middle school. I'd go shoplifting. Uh, we'd spend the summer walking around town. I mean, we had all the snacks and everything that you ever want, right? Because that's what middle school would want. So, yeah. got my brothers doing that type of stuff. And uh, um, so, anyway, continue moving forward. Eventually, my uh, biological my 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 bi- biological dad was able to use me living with him to develop a relationship with my mother again and they got remarried when i was in a, a freshman in high school so mm. uh got burglarized my neighbor and uh stole their christmas money and thought that was great stuff so now i got cash you know and uh got uh our lifelong friends at the time uh that was the last we were able to hang out with them because i might have uh violently forced them to to join us uh in that in that type of uh, endeavor and as one does as one does yes uh Went up to Rice Lake, Wisconsin there, and, uh, um, yeah, ended up getting in the, the wrong crowd again. And uh, no, this was a couple of years before my, my father would again go to prison for uh, um, child molestation. But, uh, um, but yeah, so really just rebelled pretty hardcore at the time. You know, I, I was a flow-bone atheist, and I was like, now what earth do I, I care, you know? Uh, and... Yeah, ended up uh, going in uh, burglar and doing some burglaries and uh, got into the very unique crowd so, uh, that does that type of stuff. And I mean, my so like through all this, one of the biggest things I know is like uh, my mother would uh, go to church and be like, you know, again, I, I grew up in the church. I was very, you know, we were independent, fundamental King James Bible believing Baptist, you know, went to church twice on Sunday morning, one on Sunday night, Wednesday night. I could quote the scriptures forward and backwards to you. I remember when I was a kid in Sunday school praying for the heathens that were only coming to one service on Sunday morning, not two, you know. <laughs> but uh, um, for myself, growing up in that type of environment, but then obviously going home and seeing uh, father figures that had no connection, like what, what you're seeing there versus what's at home are a complete separation, you know. And again, it's not a real, I'm responsible for my own actions, and, uh, you know, but it uh, made it very diff- difficult or it just wasn't a life that I saw any real value in. Mm-hmm. You know, so, uh, um, yeah, was fa- fast forward a little bit, uh, got into this uh, very unique crowd, and uh, I, was, I was facing uh, 50 years in prison, sitting at a, uh, um, yeah, sitting in the county jail there, and a, uh, a youth pastor came and uh, just started talking to me and just really challenging my beliefs on, on the world and life. And eventually something just clicked in me, like, I might have to, go face some God at the end of this life. And 
It didn't take a rocket scientist to realize that I don't know that meeting would go so well right now, right? right. So uh, when I was in the county jailer, I committed my life to Christ. And, uh, you know, my, uh, my family talk a lot about, like, the, uh, the before Christ and after Christ rod, you know, because came out of there, all of a sudden, you know, I'm not taking my brothers to go shoplift anymore or steal anymore. I'm taking them to church, mm-hmm. you know, and not just them. I'm bringing, like, their families with and, like, uh, their friends and stuff like that are all getting them to go to youth group now. And it, it wasn't really an option, right? Because, again, I, I had learned a hard hand and making sure people do what I want, you know, just reapplied that again. There was a lot of mentoring that young Rodney still needed. So, yeah. but, uh, so, and that man that went to, uh, the county jail and, uh, talked to me when I was 17 years old, ended up being my, uh, now wife's uncle. So I was able wow. to meet my wife, uh, through that, who she was an atheist that summer. And, uh, uh, she came to Christ shortly after that. And, uh, it was a, a real, unique opportunity again or my mother would die shortly after that and my father go to prison so we ended up uh my my brother was living with us uh when my wife and i got married and but god was able to put a number of great men into my life that would just mentor me you know like uh the man who actually married us todd arneson a part of my community service just happened to be at this church that i spent every week uh doing data entry and stuff like that for him and we were able to develop a, a great friendship and relationship as a result of that and Went to a small group with uh, um, Jim Rickey and Bruce Northey, and uh, and they just really became positive father figures in my own life. And uh, would smack me upside the head when, like, Rod, you're being an idiot. Don't do that, or that's not how you, you know, you know, treat your beautiful young wife or anything like that. And uh, it was like for me, the the first time I actually remember like a male figure taking interest in my life. Like, look, you are important, and you can do some pretty awesome things. You know. You know, you just have to really focus that type of energy and here, here's what you do that. So spend probably about five or six years of, I would consider it pretty intense, uh, mentorship because there are, again, lots of, uh, generational sin and, uh, just learned behaviors and stuff that, uh, weren't modeled to me that I needed to, to learn and obviously still more of that. But, and with that, that gives me a, a, a large passion for work with, uh, especially young men. You know, I, I connect really well with teenage guys and, uh, high school guys and, uh, just because, like in my own life, uh, I, it'd be interesting to see how I might have turned out had I had that, you know. And while I right. can't go and change that, I can, I can change the impact that I have on those around me. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's the super important thing is just mentorship, and but I just think it's the importance of, you know, what you give to others, and it's the same thing that he gave to you to kind of build you up and help make you into who you are. Um, I know that for me, I have people in my life that have done that same thing i'm very energetic and whatever anyways and it also took for me you know different men or different people in my life that knew how to direct that energy for positive things um i wasn't necessarily in in the county jail but but definitely (laughs) definitely not walk not going down any good path and definitely not a focused path or a path that was going to lead me to where i am now but it was those teachers who it's little moments that you can look back on and whether it was a teacher or a different mentor that used the energy, saw it in you and said, you know what, there's something that that can be good here and redirecting it towards something positive. Um, that made a huge difference and it allowed me to be who I am, but for the right things, just like you said, AI can be used for good. It can be used for bad. Same thing with our gifts and our talents and our lives and what we have. And yeah, I just think that's super awesome that you've taken that and now you pay forward that by mentoring other people. So um, do you see any of that same thing with you and your business? Cause I, so I know you, you know, serve with the youth, but I mean, do you try to instill some of that thing or show that type of leadership in terms of employees and in, in your business as well? Yeah. In that area, growing as a, a, a business leader has been, it, it's, 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 it's difficult for me. Cause, uh, at one hand, I, I just have a huge heart. I want to help really anyone I, I can in any way, right? But at some point, I also need to make sure that if I allow too much slack in one area, it, it negatively affects a lot of the other team members. And one of the hardest areas that I've had to grow in is how to do like employee discipline, but how to do it in a way that is still shows I care for them. And I can't. I, I would definitely wouldn't say I. Uh, no, I know I. I don't do that well yet. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, like at least in the season of life where I'm at right now, and especially the last probably two, three years, it's just been an area that I feel I know I need to work on. And I don't know where the, uh, where that line is yet. So, uh, um, you know, cause I know there's two truths that one is I, I have to, I'm called by the maker of the universe to love everyone, care for everyone and do whatever I can to help them. But too much kindness in that area without any, uh, um, discipline or correction or mentoring or anything like that will mean that other employees, really your great employees, your A-list employees will either leave to go somewhere else because they see people abusing the system as a whole, or they themselves will stop caring. You know, so if you want to build an organization that allows people to actually become the the best they can be, it requires a balance of both, you know, and uh, finding where that balance is for myself is difficult. And uh, I'm also, as I mentioned, I don't work well with others sometimes, you know, that's why I'm a business owner, yeah. but trying to learn how, how do I, my, how do I blend that with uh with employees because employees have ideas and they, uh, you know, they, they need to be nurtured and, uh, um, need to feel empowered. Uh, otherwise they'll just become drones, which isn't any help to anyone. Right. But on the other hand, they don't have 20 years of business running experience. You know, they have, they might know really well how to fix a server, but they don't might not know, well, what has been communicated to the client? Did you do too much? And it just, you know, went over their head and they feel like you're talking down to them. Did you not do any, uh, you know, so like, yeah, trying to, trying to find maybe a better way of saying it would be trying to find people's uh, both giftings and uh, weaknesses and find a way that uh, you can smooth those out. So that way they can excel in the areas that they're really great at, but then have accountability in the area or even offload uh, jobs that maybe they're not great at. Cause I can tell you technicians are normally pretty horrible at communication. Not all of them. Right. Mm-hmm. Again, but uh, um, like my brother, Tim, again, one of the top technicians ever, right? But again, if you had an email on what he's going to do, you're either going to get a one sentence of, uh, I'm going to go fix it, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then you're like, okay, why did that take 30 hours and you're charging me, you know, $5,000? Because you fixed it, right? Or he's going to write, all right, well, here's what I did. And you use like 50% of the words. You don't even know what they mean, right? Yeah. You know, so like uh, finding those, finding those, st- and that that's more what I find I have to mentor people on, especially at least in my industry. As uh, um, techs are really good at being techs. Uh, they require a lot more mentorship on how to be a uh, what I would call good customer service, but just relatable to people because they just assume everyone knows what they know and it's for, it's foreign to them the idea that someone wouldn't know what a DHP server is versus uh, you know DNS or any of that. Right? And they're like, well, duh, it's your DNS server. They're like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it just, it's just for it, you know, it's like, yeah. so anyway, uh, finding that balance for myself and how to, how to do that in a way that one doesn't bulldoze people, but also, uh, gets the results that we're looking for. So that way the, the team as a whole is healthier. Mm-hmm. It, it is really difficult for myself. Does that answer your question? It does. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. Um, yeah, well, thanks. I appreciate you opening up and sharing about your story and mentorship and definitely something I'm super passionate about too with um, giving back to underprivileged and at-risk youth with Kicking Bear and other organizations like that. So um, yeah, appreciate all you do with that for sure. Yeah. And, and just knowing you for, I, I know you firsthand and stuff too, just to, just to say that you do do an incredible job with like the young men that you're involved with. And it's, it's inspiring to me and awesome just to see, um, how natural that is. And I would just assume that that style and leadership probably tra- transfers over to your business as well. Um, but I think that's, yeah, I think mentorship and that kind of stuff is just super imp- important to me too. And I think it's the impact that, I mean, aside from real estate, you guys are actual business owners, business owners. And it's just the impact of what you guys that that I've seen with that you guys have and just business owners in general have is this huge impact of these little moments and these little focuses when that when you focus on yourself and you focus on being good leaders, not just what you do or what you bring um, in terms of, well, I'm going to start this program, I'm going to do, do this. But when you guys focus and, and leaders are focusing and building their leadership, um, it blesses and pours out to the rest of the, the staff and the workers that are under them. Um, and the importance and impact that little moments that you guys have as leaders really have on people in the same way that it's happened to you, same way, 
little encounters can literally change somebody's perspective in life. Um, and that's why I think it's important to talk about things like this and to talk about leadership, especially in the community, is because the impact that leaders have on the community around them, they're the ones that like love and, and patience and inspiration and compassion can flow from them to everybody else. And I just think it's so important for leaders to have that view the same way that you view things, the same way Austin views things in terms of servant leadership and loving people and being genuine. I just think that is beyond important in business. And I think when our business leaders and the people that are leading the community can do that, it just has this impact that is incredible. And so, yeah, I appreciate you sharing everything and it's, it, it's super important. Um, and I think it's super important for leaders for sure. being on the top to hear that um, because you guys talk about success and what it is, but like a little bit of like what you're mentioning, your guys' success leads to other people's success. If your company wasn't as successful as it is, like your that success is leading to other people finding their definition of success and being able to be comfortable and to lead and uh, live a life that they want with their family and without Austin doing what he's done, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be in the position where I am to be able to provide and be at a level of comfort to have my wife stay at home and be a full-time mom. And so it's because Austin was successful first and then had that leadership that has poured into me to be able to find my level of success um, that then in turn affects my wife and then For sure. my youngster who doesn't even know it, but Addie is impacted by that. And so um, I just think it's super, super incredible and I don't think you have to be a business owner to be that person. You know what I mean? That you can be that person to uh, the kid without a dad in their life who is going through elementary school or middle school or um, the kid who maybe has a dad but isn't present with them or a kid who's going down the wrong track or, um, yeah, business owners have a, have a obligation to serve their employees and the people that they work with. But, um, doesn't matter who you are. You can be that person to a lot of different people. And I mean, you hear the stories, Rod's stories, and I know others who it's that one moment or that one person, that youth pastor, or that somebody that stepped into their life that that was like the 180 change in direction for that person's life. Um, and I know a lot of people who are that person for a lot of different people. And you just extrapolate that out to that person the maybe somebody you mentored is now that person for somebody else and that person for somebody else and i think the the return on that investment can be exponential in the amount of people that you can impact so yeah if i was going to touch on that i'd say i i, I think if if i was talking oh, i guess we are talking to however many people watch this right you know like i mean uh, hundreds of thousands, hundreds <laughs> of thousands. <laughs> you know the greatest impact i've seen in my life through both to me personally and when i'm uh, connect with others that uh, is really one on one times. You know, I mean, we all want to be on the uh, um, uh, Austin Stewart uh, podcast or something like yeah. that, right? You know, thinking like, hey, I'm going to talk to 100,000 people. But whether or not you're like a lead pastor at a mega church or, you know, you're a small group leader or something like that, I think the most impactful amount of time any of us have is when we're one on one with someone else. You mm -hmm. know, and you gain the ability to have a friendship and speak truth to that individual. And that individuals that, regardless of what level of leadership we have, because even if we lead in a, lot, a giant organization, you're still leading people one at a time and one-on-one -on -one type of thing. You know, very few talks or, you know, programs or anything like that really impact it. It's more the one-on-one -on -one mentorship that you're going to be able to empower, which, like to what you said, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a business leader or whether or not you're working on the factory floor somewhere and you have no one over, no one under you to lead, right? You can still, you know, you could lead your boss uh, in other areas or you can go home and uh, volunteer at uh, Kicking Bear there with Kevin or... Uh, you know, go ahead and uh, help out at your local church. Or, I mean, there's always, it, it's not hard to find one person. I, and I, I think especially to young people, what they want is the platform so they can speak and change 100,000 people's mind on, on a subject, right? That's why we want, you know, TikTok influencers or anything like that because you want to be yeah. cool to 100,000. And the real power comes in being cool to one person. And oftentimes, like at youth group, you know, if I'm sitting there, I always have a chair next to me and everyone that walks by like, hey, I saved you a chair. Come sit down here. I saved you a chair, right? Because they want to know that they think I'm cool, that I think they're cool, right? I saved them a chair. And like I know in a youth, in a, in a high school environment, being able to be invited to come sit with a group is probably one of the greatest gifts you could give someone, especially if they're new, right? And regardless of wherever we're going or anything like that, that's one-on-one -on -one mentorship, regardless of what level of, of platform we specifically have. That's awesome. I love that. So that if I had to give someone one piece of advice, it would definitely be 
find some small group of uh, um, like-minded individuals that will help you grow closer to the maker of the universe and just go to that. And again, if you go to one and it doesn't work, find a different one. Yeah. It's like going out to eat at a restaurant. You're not going to like every one. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> one of them's going to like it. But apparently go to this ramen place in Sparta. Oh, yeah, ramen place. Uh, Keep I forget going to Sparta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was the weirdest thing. I, I, like, why on earth does Sparta have a ramen? But, but yeah, it is good. If, huh. you guys, if you guys haven't gone there, go make a trip What's out What's the name there. of it? Uh, You're no help. So I'm just supposed to... No, no, no. All right. Okay. Sparta is not a metropolis, okay? <laughs> if you Google ramen in Sparta, you are not... It's not like which of these five is it, okay? Yeah. So, uh, right. yeah. It's probably the only... Google. Ra- yeah, it's, it's, the, the, it's the only ramen place, I think, in Monroe County. So. <laughs> probably true. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for coming, Rod. That was a lot of fun. We appreciate yeah, thanks your for having me. wisdom and insight. And uh, I think our listeners will definitely get value from this one so thank you appreciate yeah. it make sure to go uh get the books where too can they and... get it amazon they can go on amazon or they just come over to my office i'll give them one for free okay Whoa! <laughs> salesman of the year yeah i do Three what I books can. yeah so yeah go check them out apparently there's new ones coming yep and uh come. whenever i get a week off <laughs> and then and uh when your computers get hacked you know who to call that's right call your friend right oh there it is appreciate it awesome all, all right thanks right. good see you next time Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. We sincerely hope that you found value in today's episode and learned at least one thing that you can take back and implement into your lives and businesses. As always, we appreciate your support and hope you can all find a way to pay it forward this week.